Zooming in on music. Hello, everybody. This is Michel Gila again, viola player from the Concertgebouw Orchestra and artistic director of Music Stages. I have the privilege and the honor to talk to a distinguished music journalist and critic, Mr. Ken Smith from New York and sometimes Hong Kong. Uh, Ken and I have been friends for a very long time, but we haven't spoken for a while. So forgive me if I start with a personal question. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing quite well, all things considered. Uh, I, I realize that, um, that there are so many different shades and nuances to uh, answer that question in, in these days. But uh, I mean, given what I do and given what uh, a lot of people do, um, you know, I, the life is divided between the very public, very outgoing uh, portions, and then the internal things that you do at home and you don't want anybody around anyway. So mm -hmm. that part, the latter part, was done very well this year, I have to say. It was the other part, which involves travel and involves a lot of music and public performances that I think we're all really, really missing now, even though some semblance of that has come back online. Yeah, but uh, I, I mean, for, for people that don't know you, uh, it's important to say that you are much more than just a, a just than a journalist, uh, be it a distinguished journalist. Uh, you are actually much more a foreign correspondent, to especially traveling between uh, the China and US and sometimes Europe. So uh, I, this has been disrupted uh, dramatically, hasn't it? Well, it has. And, and you're right. When you say I'm in New York, but a little bit of Hong Kong, it's, it's really about half and half. And we've figured it out uh, over the years uh, that it's been very different in terms of how much travel back and forth and how much time per place, because out of the Hong Kong time involves travel to China and Singapore and all of the, the Asian region, basically. And out of New York involves, you know, projects that we've done in San Francisco. And even some of Europe is sort of... Uh, Either way, we can take that out of Hong Kong or, or New York. But it's been half and half, uh, really, ever since about 2004. And okay. I would say about 150 to 60 days in each city every year. Wow, so, so, so how little we see each other. Uh, yes, and uh, I, I know, I think I, you still owe me a bottle of Geneva. I mean, we have uh -huh. to take care of that. That is true. We will, I promise, as soon as I'm allowed uh, to come to New York and visit you in your great apartment on Central Park, uh, I'll bring Yeneva uh, with me. And I was going to say, I, I would love to just join there and we'll, we'll have to, we'll, well, one city or another we will share. The last time was Hong Kong, wasn't it? And, and, and you gave me a wonderful tour together with Joanna, with your wife, and it's been just wonderful. I, I have such fond memories of that time, especially this a little strange restaurant with all dark figures in there and delicious food. I shall never forget that. I have some great photos of, from that. Maybe I can find them somewhere and put them in the video. You have been a correspondent for the Financial Times uh, for a long time. Is that still oh. going on now? Yes, it's, it, it's going on a bit. Uh, up, up, it was going really right up until the pandemic. And now things are sort of on hold uh, with me as they are with, with, with musicians and other people with, with their institutions. But uh, I, we should start back a bit because, uh, you know, there, there is a big difference uh, technically in the business between a correspondent and people who just uh, report from other destinations. But yes, in the broad scheme, I, I am a correspondent. Hmm. Um, I have been writing about music really for... Um, since the, the early 1990s. And that is a very broad range of things that be from between annotation and reporting and writing profiles and writing reviews and all those kind of things. And I tended to um, really write from the, from the basis of a journalist. Now, unlike a lot of, of people who are critics and who write about music, I, I basically came up through journalism school and happened to be a musician rather than a musician who then later learned the, the rules of the trade. So uh, my path was a little bit different from the beginning, and I think that sort of shaped what I do. I've also wound up in places that tend to like a holistic view of things, like the Financial Times, and uh, we, we'll talk about that a little later. But, but I would say, as a correspondent, a lot of what I write is more... Um, when you're talking about a critical evaluation, there's a lot more involved. Now, every piece about music that the people write involves some reporting and some critical analysis. Now, whether it's a critique with a little bit of reporting or whether it's a report with a little critical analysis, that, that will vary depending on the publication 
and the reader and what people, how much information they want, but everything has a little bit of both. So I was there and writing for uh, over, over my, my span, dozens, if not hundreds of different publications and types of media. And everybody has different expectations or is listening for different things. So I've always been attuned to that. And because a lot of the publications that I wrote for during my life were for England, for example, um, Gramophone, The Strad, International Arts Manager, then these, these, were, these were places that didn't necessarily have a context for what was coming out of America. So a large part of my job was already explaining America to my own country, to, to um, uh, other people who at least, you know, ostensibly spoke the same language, even though they might not have come from the same background. And so when I actually got into traveling to different countries, I was already very attuned to that part of the, of the job. So uh, particularly in Asia, uh, I think a lot of people uh, take it with a very different, uh, very different set of, of, of guidelines. But I was already had the, the, the correspondent mentality in before I even, even started. For some reason, uh, at least as far as, as I'm concerned, uh, I, I feel also I'm guilty of that. I, I, we, I have not reached out enough to, to, to my friends and colleagues uh, overseas. So, so what I hear from, from the United States are absolute horror stories, but maybe you can shine your, your light on that and maybe you can, uh, uh, well, put, put us at ease a little bit because I mean, the, uh, the fact that the, probably the most famous opera house in the world has been shut down completely is, is a huge scare to everybody over, over here. I mean, what is happening if, if, if the, like the centerpiece of opera tradition is, is uh, in jeopardy? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting that you point that out because uh, this is both the result and in some way um, pushing forward of what was already happening before the pandemic, which is that um, uh, the world of, of inter international classical music or basically anything international where there was an, a, a real exchange between uh, uh, people of different countries and what was going on. We felt like we weren't just American or Dutch or Chinese, but we were all part of a, of a global situation, a global community of, of people in our discipline. And unfortunately now we've lost the direct contact with, the, with, with our, our colleagues. In and so we are left with things that are online and other, other forms of media, which doesn't really give you the, the real picture of what's happening. And also in, in, in the broader spectrum, uh, the, I, the, the difference in countries between the people who want to be, well, let's say America first versus uh, America as part of the global community. And you can say the same thing for sure about China, about Russia, about you pick your country, basically. Uh, that faction has been winning out uh, on, 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 as a result of the COVID virus because everyone has been uh, by, by default part of their national or local bubble. And they've never, they're not even allowed sometimes to, in, in America, go from state to state freely without a, a, a quarantine situation. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it is very difficult. And that, um, there are positive things and there are negative things in that. And the, 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 the worst problem is, it has definitely hurt the biggest institutions, the institutions that were already global, if you will, that already thought about um, well, the Metropolitan Opera being a key part, hmm. uh, the, the New York Philharmonic being another one across the hall. They considered themselves as leaders, uh, uh, if not the ultimate um, temple of their respective world. And now they are shut down and unable to operate for a number of different reasons. Yeah. I, I uh, you say that this was a global trend happening way before the, the COVID crisis, and, and I'm afraid you're right. And maybe this all has to do with the internet and it, uh, how it affects people and how the, it affects the communication between people. But um, at the same time, uh, I, I don't know, it's, do you think there is, uh, with, with the election of, of uh, Biden now, do you think this is possibly a, a trend in, in the opposite direction, reaching out again, looking for cooperation, or, or am I being naive there? Well, I, there's a lot to repair 
in that regard. Um, I think, first of all, you, Biden is not necessarily the most cultured president we've ever had, but he's not actively against culture. <laughs> I mean, well, he, 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 a huge improvement. <laughs> he, he understands and respects that. And, and you know, he has a track record of that, of, of, of turning up to these type of events. Um, in terms of uh, culture as a, as a means of international exchange, I mean, that, that would, will come back to a degree, assuming that the other side is, is ready, willing, and able. Um, you know, situations that we hear from uh, the, in, in, in the United Kingdom vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the EU uh, are even more direct and more palpable in terms of tension than, than America, because America is, is, you know, is already larger and, kind of, and sort of function in a way on, on a much better level. If you take all of the European musicians out of the UK, it, it makes a significant impact. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the Brexit is something that that nobody in the music world can fathom. I, I, it, it's just unbelievable. Uh, you said rightly, what's happening to all all these musicians that live there and 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 uh, made an impact not only on British music life but on the London was the the, the musical capital of Europe. So what's going to happen in that uh, respect? Uh, I mean, this is just uh, this is just awful. I mean, this is COVID is just uh, piling on on other other <laughs> other problems we had. I think you're 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 certainly right there. Well, But, exactly right. Now, do we want to talk about the good side or the bad side? Well, hopefully both, because because I think we should uh, be realistic, and 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 face uh, the challenges that we uh, we have, mm -hmm. and at the same time we should also also see if 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 we can see a, a glimpse of hope, maybe maybe there is stuff developing uh, which which will help us further, because uh, further we do want to go. That is for sure. We will not. Well, in, in terms of what we've seen, like, or, or for our next, you know. Our, topic of conversation now do we start with the good or the bad <laughs> well let's start with the bad so uh <laughs> how do you see the chances uh, of of these big uh institutions that the u.s has like the met the new york phil the, the boston symphony the, the all these great orchestras and and the great great cultural institutions uh how how, how do you see the future ahead of us on the on the short term short short term and the short term short term is still is still tough is still difficult because you have a situation where um, like every other element of society that you want to point out to people are not affected different uh, the same it affects different people in different stations much differently whether we're talking about different countries in the world whether we're talking about different institutions and different levels of institutions in terms of budget in terms of size in terms of, of reach. Now, it, let's start with uh, the macro level on, on different countries. Um, China is kind of back in operation to a degree that if you are in America right now, no one here could quite understand. I, they, they just wouldn't get how much, how, how much these, uh, that, that country has, has gone back to business as usual. With, of course, COVID caveats. There are, there are differences now, for sure but it's moving in a way that America certainly is not. Uh, America in some ways has a partial reopen, but it has never quite gotten back to normal. Europe in certain parts of the, the continent, certainly, certain countries were almost back to normal. I mean, you could be convinced in some places that there was uh, no virus problem left anymore. And then all of a sudden there was. And so you have the second shutdown, which in a way is more debilitating than the first. Once you, you think it's done and then it's not done, then it, you get hit on a different level. Uh, well, in America- The, the, the Americans, uh, they, they try to adopt the Swedish model, just shut your eyes and ignore it. But the problem is Sweden is, is a very scarcely popul populated country. So it'll never uh, spread as, as, as seriously as it will in the US with all these huge yeah. cities. True, and we have we have two very different countries, as you know about the U.S. We have the, the red states and blue states, and they are uh, very much different in terms of the entire, not just the 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 political spectrum, but also the social spectrum and how they relate. Uh, it is very hard to get any kind of national statement on this, re regardless of who's in the White House. Uh, because you have parts of the country that are very urbanized and very dense, 
and people have a different sense of proxemics of how close am I to the next person? They're very conscious of that. And then you have other places where the population density is, is, is nowhere near that. You could spend an entire day uh, without coming six to 10 feet from another person. So to, to have one um, policy that actually embraces both sides in, in a way that people understand, that is, is, is extremely difficult to communicate. As a, as a political leader and very hard to implement because uh, once you have something that's devised by a city, people from the country already feel suspect about it and, and they, they have a hard time with that. And so, um, you know, people look at, at masks as basically an extension of the handguns, but in reverse, <laughs> where they want their handguns, they absolutely do, and, and taking them away would, would impact their freedom. Having them putting, making people put a mask on is definitely also impacting their freedom. So it's just the, the inverse of that. Um, so what you have in that is in a way, a lack of America as a sense of, it's not even nationalist anymore. It's, it's, also, it's also very regionalist and, and people relate to their own cities and their own states and, 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 and areas in a much different way in the past, I would say, uh, well, that, that has been growing, but certainly in, in the past uh, 10 months. Um, the good side. Let's talk about some of the good sides, the, the good things okay. that come out of that. <laughs> Lighten it up a bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, in a way, places are, have now thought about themselves and, and communicating and, and connecting to their local audiences in a way that they never have had to do or haven't had to do in a long time. Um, if you are an opera house or a symphony orchestra, you expect you might go out into the neighborhood for sure, but your core business is the concert hall. Your core venue, your home is the opera house. And your job is to get people to come in. Well, for the last 10 months, that really has not been an option. So how do you reach the audience? And we've had, uh, you know, when you don't have the concert hall, and so there is, of course, Zoom and Zoom and, and the Internet is the great equalizer in that way, because people can. It's, it, yeah, watch we the, sound bad on Zoom. <laughs> well, exactly. You, people, people will turn up. People can mute you on Zoom, which you can't really do in a concert hall. <laughs> uh, things like that make it a very different um, situation, a different relationship. But also there are operas, there are uh, uh, orchestras that have taken themselves out of that situation. Now, now um, I've seen operas in the past few weeks on Zoom, of course, or on, the, or on YouTube that have been done in sporting arenas, that have been done in um, drive-in theaters, you know, which also the drive-in theater itself was something that did not exist until COVID. That sort of came back as, as, as a retro look. Uh, I've, and, and parking lots, parking garages, uh, you know, an, an amazing uh, performance of Wagner. It was done in a parking garage that happened to be across from the opera house and people would drive through. That's sort of a merger of uh, the well, drive-through. Wagner would have loved it, I'm sure. <laughs> I, well, exactly. It's a, a, but an open air performance that actually has some life because the Chicago Lyric Opera will be bringing this on as sort of their supplemental programming in another season where hopefully their audience will be back, their primary audience will be back in the concert hall. Yeah. But you have this sort of sense of alternative venues, alternative approaches to presenting this art that will perhaps get it out and, and into more of the area where people you know, live, so to speak, today. The New York Philharmonic, which is uh, shut down uh, as an institution and also shut down with, with their facility uh, because of Lincoln Center uh, being, being, being closed. They uh, had a very in innovative idea called the New York Philharmonic Bandwagon, where Anthony Roth Costanzo, as a, a countertenor, would travel on basically on the back of a flatbed truck with a bunch of musicians uh, in, in, from the Philharmonic playing small chamber uh, arrangements. And they would be sort of leading the cheer in pop up concerts in, in parks and street corners around the city. And they have their logo, you know, the New York Philharmonic on the truck itself. And in, in a way that, as um, uh, Anthony said, that was literally they're taking the art to the people. 
of New York. Oh, it's, it's like going back to the 12th century. The troubadours are back, traveling on their uh, horses or on foot and, and, and playing for the music, playing music for the people that are just there. That's well, to their credit, they never claimed it's an original idea. That's true. <laughs> but they certainly modernized it and they made it New York and they made it local. And the New York Philharmonic in particular was never an organization that people had really ever considered New York. Yeah. I mean, they considered themselves as part of a national expression and, and in a way, one, one of the great orchestras of the world. But if you, if you try to put the civic pride of the New York Phil versus, let's say, the Cleveland Orchestra or the Detroit Symphony, uh, those, those are absolutely considered part of their city the same way sports franchises in those city are, are considered part of the city. So I was listening to, to PBS News Hour, and there was a report on, on uh, singers and, and artists uh, which normally perform on Broadway who are without, out of work now, returning back uh, to where they came from. So I was wondering if that also will have, in a, in a strange way, and not in a way that we all wished, uh, an, an, a positive impact on the cultural life of those places. Because surely these people are still creative and they will still want to do things, even, even in a place which is maybe not as glamorous as Broadway. Do you see any of that happening? Well, it's hard for me to say that I see it because uh, I really have barely left New York in the, this year. You know, I've, I've gone back to, to Ohio for a bit for, for family business, but uh, I can't say that I really went out to see anything there because there was not much going on, frankly, yeah. uh, in terms of public events. But, but you're, you're right in that um, the, the life of, of America has been changing quite a bit. Uh, the life for any artist and the, the idea of centralization that... Um, New York wasn't necessarily the center. Well, it wasn't necessarily the the um, theatrical world of America, and it wasn't the publishing world. But that's where the companies were, and the and the, the talent went to certain cities because of that, and in in the way that you know a lot of uh, computer people wind up in in and, and tech people wind up in Silicon Valley. Or, or Seattle, that's where the action is. And they'll get more stimulation there in their business than they will if they're you know, back at, at, at home in Iowa where they grew up. You'll see, ne not necessarily, uh, well, you'll see a little bit of change in that because I think we were already heading that way. Because the idea, the old school idea of musicians going in and working with uh, an orchestra, or as a soloist, getting a manager and then getting their record label and having everything basically laid out. That has sort of faded away in the last few years. And and the internet, to a large part, uh, and the ability to record and distribute yourself and to or to set up those kind of mechanisms yourself. If you are an artist who has that kind of tech savvy or know people who have that kind of tech savvy, uh, you can make it work in a way that you don't have to live in New York anymore. You could live anywhere. And, and uh, that has, has offered a bit of freedom that, yes, a lot of people today have, have taken advantage of in a way that they wouldn't have, have had to before if they had their day job. Yeah. Now they're, they're looking at all sorts, sometimes out of, out of um, boredom, many times out of ab actual need to move forward and to, to make money and, and to continue their life. They're starting these kind of adventures and, and we'll call them adventures. And because a lot of times it is totally uncharted territory. But uh, they. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. And, and I've also been guilty of, of producing stuff for the internet. Uh, not that I'm any good at it, but <laughs> and, anyway, I mean, we all did it out of, out of uh, our, our need to express ourselves and our need to reach out to people. But uh, I, I hope and pray that this will not replace the, the experience of live music. This, uh, to me, there is, just, there is just no comparison. Maybe I'm old fashioned and, and maybe things have to develop in a way that, that it will become more realistic and, and more, more authentic online as well. But, but uh, the experience of sharing music live uh, in a venue, being next to other people, being able to speak to them, to, to see them, to, to feel, feel the energy is, is just something else. But I, I don't know. I mean, you've seen, you've been to more concerts than I have listening, I'm sure. So, uh, how, well, how I've, I've, I've been with you. 
And, 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 you know, in the past year, I've had a chance to read more than I have in quite some time. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, you, you put up a very valid argument that I think we all worry about when this thing comes out. But uh, then again, you know, I'm looking back through my history and really radio, radio was a horrible thing because that was going to kill off live concerts. <laughs> and then you jump ahead and, and you read something else from, you know, 10 years, 15 years later, recording. Oh, my God. Recording is going to kill the radio. And we're never going to have radio again. And you go, the internet, oh my God, downloads are going to kill the recording industry. Yeah. And streaming, Maybe. streaming will kill Hollywood. No, it's horrible, horrible. We, people will never go into cinema again. Well, in some ways, uh, you can say that it doesn't, uh, uh, the, the, the industry changes and you will never have that. But, you know, the automobile did not mean that horses became extinct. You know, we will have horses. Now we have a different relationship to horses than we did before. You, we respect horses in a very different way than we did when they were there to pull things and to ride as your sole method of transportation. And in some ways, I think the people who have come out of the, the uh, Zoom concert experience, knowing that something is missing, are going to really be returning to live concerts with vengeance. Now, on the other hand, if they can't make it to a live concert, well, I'll catch it on Zoom. So I think ultimately the disruptive technology actually then just becomes part of the world around and it's accommodated and doesn't necessarily kill off the previous incarnations. It just adds to the overall palette and, and possibilities. Uh, I, I so do hope that you're right. I, 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 and, and yeah, you must be because you are a wiser person than I am. Um, I, well, I well, we'll see. <laughs> I, I, I take, I, I, you know, it's unfortunate because, you know, as they say, past performance is no, uh, you know, guarantee or, or indication of future possibilities. But uh, I think the, the, the deck is in our favor. Yeah. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about money. Uh, musicians love money. Many musicians love money, and and most people listening to this podcast will be musicians. Uh, unfortunately, I myself have no talent whatsoever with money, but uh, it's an essential part of what we do. And uh, in the second uh, edition of this podcast, I spoke to Simon Reining, uh, the the director of the Concertgebouw. And, and he said uh, some words of serious uh, warning. He said, after the COVID crisis will be the economic crisis. He was not talking about the economic crisis now, but the one that is ahead of us. He says an, uh, a recession or depression is inevitable and it will have consequences. Uh, let's assume he's right. How, how will the music world cope with this crisis on top of a crisis in let's say a year or two? What do you think? Well, I think that, that there are two, we have to define our terms a little bit because you know, I think uh, certainly in America and, I, and I'm sure that, that you in Europe have seen argument after argument about the death of classical music and how, and how it's going to be ending. Oh, we've and been sometimes sooner, <laughs> sooner and late, sooner and then and then later and then then sooner again, and and the thing is that there are situations like this, and like uh, the economic collapse of two thousand eight, or wherever you want to go back, wherever you want to go back, World War Two, as as as, a, as an economic disruptor, that was pretty pretty intense, I have to say, and uh, for for everyone, and America just happened to have gotten out of it a little bit quicker. But um, wherever you want to go back, the Great Depression, uh, all of these have had an impact. They have not necessarily had an impact on music. There's a difference between musicians. We have a lot of musicians in the world. But the companies and the structure that allows them to have these kind of things, those get disrupted a lot, sometimes severely. And there are times that you just have to throw the model out and start again or refine it with whatever the conditions are today. And that, that, is a, a, that's, that, that has been a, a situation that's been in a way a constant shifting, or maybe not constant, but let's say frequent shifting when, when things like this happen in the world. Um, the idea of 
the internet is great, but even the great internet pioneers had no idea how to monetize that for a, you know, a solid decade until things started to fall into place. Uh, we are in a, in a pretty disruptive pattern in terms of music. Uh, and, and in terms of the big institutions, as I, as I was saying before, it, you can't have, a, you can't depend on a large management company or a large uh, recording company or, or even a, an orchestra or a, a, any of that to take care of you. So in that respect, a lot of ways, it, it has to come down to individuals figuring out how to do this. And th literally bringing the gig economy back into this until the big um, the big institutions actually figure out what they're doing. So, the, so you think you think there will be a trend to to small smaller scale uh, projects like the bandwagon of the New York Phil to to more chamber music, chamber orchestra of chamber uh, opera type of performances in in more informal settings. This is what uh, what uh, even Fisher said when I spoke to him. He he expected that to happen. And I, I'm sure. I mean, he's a he's a big maestro, and 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 he's been conducting Marla and the big stuff all over the world. So I'm sure that will not completely stop, but maybe it will be less readily available, and instead, other stuff will come. Do you well, think? Well, the idea of filling the Metropolitan Opera of you know any any hall that's more than three thousand seats every night that is just not sustainable. Frankly, you know, you know, seven nights a week, eight, eight performances, whatever. That is extremely difficult now. When you consider um, uh, the, the 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 popular uh, approach to the art form, and also the the level of, of different options. I mean, pe people don't go out to movies like that anymore. I mean, they just don't leave for that. The 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 the, the opportunities are very different now. So, you, excuse me. Are you talking about now at this point, or are you also looking into the future when you say that? Because I, my, my heart almost stopped because uh, the Konzerthaus is one of those buildings that that eventually we hope that it will go back uh, hosting two thousand people every night. As it well, used well, the Konzerthaus and, and and Carnegie Hall, they're they're very similar institutions in a way, because both of them. Yes, they're known for classical music, but they're also, um, they understand that listeners out there are not just about Mahler, you know, they also like good jazz. They also like really thoughtful pop music and, and, and particular music of other cultures too. All of that is part of the mix. And so serious music, regardless of genre, is kind of treated with, with, with I won't say equal sensibility, but sensibility that makes sense for each genre. And so, that already makes it uh, makes it easier than just the Metropolitan Opera, which is geared toward very large grand opera performances. Um, so you look back, to, okay, through history, and during those those periods that we were talking about, not just the methods of presenting repertory works, but but new works being com com composed changed with with the conditions. So there was a lot of chamber opera that came up after the Second World War and, 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 and around the Depression. Some of it was actually written for radio originally. Some of it was, was written for television and it's, and it's entered the stage sort of sideways uh, into that. Uh, Britain's, uh, well, Britain's chamber operas and particularly the ones written for, for church performance, I couldn't imagine that being done in an era where people were making a lot of money and going out to big, big and, and it was all about big shows. But, and, and the best of the shows that are made under those circumstances will enter the repertory and will continue. And particularly in a, in a period where we are today, yeah, A Mall of the Night Visitors gets done every, almost every Christmas somewhere. Um, smaller shows like uh, Turn of the Screw or um, uh, uh, Trouble in Tahiti, for example, Leonard Bernstein's you know two character chamber opera. Of course, it helped that he just celebrated a centenary. But there were but there were a lot of performances of of that piece, and these kind of things uh, sort of sort of move in and 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 enter into the the cyclical nature of the repertory. All of a sudden, something that was composed during one pandemic, all of a sudden, we resonates with us today. And okay. so. so that, that 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 kind of comes out, and it might be yes. Uh, maybe Mahler does represent or uh, resonate with us, but maybe the conditions in which we want to hear Mahler optimally don't. 
and we have to wait a while for that. Yeah, yeah. How how is the Met going to survive? I mean, the the, the American cultural life is is uh, largely based on on uh, on generous gifts from private people, isn't it? I mean, the the uh, the government and 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 the local authorities uh, they don't spend that much money on culture. So uh, how how uh, how are they going to do? Is is that you think it's it's resilient enough? This model, the, well, the, what the we Met, call the Anglo-Saxon model, right? The, the Met has a has a model that is unfortunately being bombarded by all sides. I mean, first of all, their their um, primary facility is is shuttered. Uh, they they can't get in. They have they do happen to have a a, a very uh, superb and valuable backlog of archival material that they have been mining very well. But the problem is that that lasted for about five to six months. And now we're, we're in, in the, the, the second level of, of, of repetition. They've essentially run out of, of what they have to play. And now they have to curate it differently and try to package it differently. Uh, and they've sold many subscriptions that, uh, the, to their, their um, uh, on-demand service. So that level, did very well. But the core institution of the Met, first of all, it's identified with, as we said, Grand Opera, and, and it's a very large hall. And there's another element that, that enters into this, which is that they do not have control over their real estate. So if they did, I mean, basically they have to deal with Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center owns the buildings. They are a tenant, they're a resident ensemble, but they just can't go into a building unilaterally and say, we're going to do an opera for no audience and just record it. They, they, they're really forbidden from that. The New York Philharmonic, same situation. If Lincoln Center says our hall is not open, it's not open. Now, on the other hand, uh, we have Detroit, we have Cleveland, they are in control of their own halls. They have done several shows for an audience of five, basically most of whom I think were employees, but for the camera and recorded and beautifully recorded with multiple camera angles and in a way that they don't even have to worry about obstructing the audience view. The cameras can just capture the orchestra. Now, this is not a sustainable model for sure, but that will keep them going for a little bit. That will give them something to do. It's something they can look back on, but the Met really on so many levels cannot function as an organization from the aspect of, of, of uh, for, well, for artistically and, and logistically, they, are, they just have all their hands tied. Wow, that's really scary. I mean, one of my former colleagues, uh, uh, Milan Milosavljevic, he's, uh, he's solo viola player now in the Met, and uh, I haven't spoken to him in a while. Maybe I, I will uh, reach out to him in this series because I'm, I'm just dying to know how, how he's getting on. He's a very creative guy, and I'm sure he will somehow manage, but uh, yeah, it, 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 it must be scary. It must be so, so frightening for all these great musicians. I mean, such a fantastic ensemble. And, and uh, such a history and, and wow, it's really scary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean we don't have the, the crystal ball. I would love to have the crystal ball to pull out so I could read the future, but uh, we don't know exactly how that will go, but it's, it, it, all of the things that we're learning now are transferable job skills. I mean, everything that we've had to do uh, and, 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 and adapt and get us off and learn new talents and, 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 and uh, uh, broaden the knowledge base and broaden the, the, the skill set, all of that will come in handy in some way. And, 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 I, and I don't think it's going to register later until it does. We don't know why we're doing what we do in the long term. We're just getting through the day. But ultimately, we're going to change out of all of this. And uh, when this does come out, we're going to be very different people, but uh, able to function at a, at a I hope higher level. Oh, I'm 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 so glad that you are such an optimistic person. That uh, I, I I'm I'm uh, Austrian and, and a bit with Slavic blood, so so I tend to be melancholy. So it's nice to hear an optimistic person. Um, well, it's it's interesting because you know my, my favorite take on that was uh, I was having dinner with with um, um, uh, one, uh, my hosts out in 
San Francisco once when, when we were doing a project with the San Francisco Opera. And there was a Chinese man and uh, his wife, who was, who was Caucasian, and myself. And I said something that was reasonably forward-looking. And he, he, uh, he said, well, I see you're a glass half full guy. My wife, she's a glass half empty woman. You know, I, I trained as an engineer, so that I just think the glass is twice as big as it should be. <laughs> it's very funny. Uh, uh, I, I spoke recently, I spoke also to, to the Australian composer, Brett Dean, and, mm -hmm. and he, he told me something that you can probably verify. He said, uh, the Chinese word for crisis is danger plus opportunity. Uh, Indeed. Is, is, is that true? That is very true. Yes. Wow. I, I think that's and it's also important to learn. To learn. Did, did did Brett talk about the uh, his COVID situations? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. We we spoke about it, uh, and and uh, yeah, it, it, it was delightful to speak to him. He's uh, he's such a such a nice guy, and and he lives now in the countryside uh, near London, and uh, he keeps writing and and he keeps the spirits up, so he's doing fine. Um, well, that's that's no. I, I, th th there's just uh, one little issue that that has been sort of paining me. Uh, while everybody agrees that we are in a huge crisis, uh, the stock market has just reached the the Dow Jones has just reached an all time high, and there are these pie uh, these people like uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk uh, owning unbelievable, unrealistic, idiotic amounts of money. Is there any signs that, are, are there any signs that people like those, uh, them, or maybe not them exactly, but, but people in those league uh, care for the arts and, and will be prepared to, to, to muck in? Do, do you see any, any hope in that? Well, at the moment, no. But then again, I didn't see that, uh, you know, Bill Gates at one point would turn into such a, a massive philanthropist. Yeah. Um, and, and in his respect, it's not necessarily the arts as much as it is other causes. The arts play into that a little bit, but it's much more um, health oriented and, 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 and broader cultural issues. But uh, the, the idea of philanthropy is sort of a second generation thing mm -hmm. and or, at, you know, toward the end. Um, Getting back to the glass half full, glass half empty situation, uh, your glass half full people are the ones who are looking and have the, the ability to look and the freedom to look six months, a year, a year and a half ahead to when we're out of this and what have we learned and how can we do? They're already working on that. The glass half empty people are the ones whose you know, government money will run out next month or are really trying to figure out how they're going to pay the bill and what's happening between now and the end of the year. And on, on, on a larger level, you know, in terms of the, the economic data, there's a lot of economic data that, that is, is skewed toward that. And, and certainly the U.S. and, and that, that's the country I know best, obviously, but uh, the U.S. is in, in, in a, a financial mess that we, it will take years to get out of. But in terms of those people who are looking ahead, yes, the opportunities are there and they will take off absolutely as soon as there's any sign of, first of all, a sane government economic financial policy and a, a vaccine and a health situation that will, will allow people to get out and, and, and function again. Um, one of the things, that, and it, it, on one hand, it's very hard to look at, at, at Bezos, yes, and say Amazon is making an obscene amount of money because even I think Bezos would admit that it's an obscene amount of money. But on the other hand, for any company that, that was able to hit the ground running and get retail and get items to people who no longer could go to stores, who could function in an environment like this, um, I don't entirely begrudge Amazon. I just think that uh, things got totally out of whack and need to be, be uh, you know, brought back to a normal level. They actually did fulfill something that uh, was, was badly needed in society. Now, at, at, at the time when society needed it. Uh, now, I, I, I look forward now to the time that the correction, <laughs> the correction will be able to come. I mean, un unfortunately, uh, the Americans hate the word socialism. But uh, I mean, what we mean, uh, what it actually is supposed to be is like, you know, give give people a, a decent life and and uh well the the 
problem that many people have with with uh, companies like uh, like Amazon or maybe Uber is is that their that their wealth is built on on the exploiting uh, on exploiting uh, the people working for them. Uh, well, but th that's my European take, and I'm sure all the Americans listening to this will hate me for it. But well, uh, well, it's you, you have you have an you have an act you have a, a very valid point. But what, another thing that, that that strikes me about that is that the the um, whole economic discourse with Uber, with Amazon, with with Airbnb, with a lot of other things uh, that that now falls under you know the gig economy, as they will. They're using terms that that musicians. And freelance writers and whatever have, have used for a hundred years. You know, the, the idea that goes into that, we we are very well aware of. And so the rest of the world, in a way, is sort of catching up to 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 that, to us. Yeah. There, there is, uh, I, I can't remember how it said, so it's, it's going to turn out really bad. Uh, but it was a uh, definition of a jazz musician is, uh, is somebody who takes his uh, $5,000 instrument and, and uh, he, he spends uh, $500 on equipment to do a, 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 to do a ride in his $50 car to finally earn $5 for his gig. <laughs> so, yes. so, so that's as far as gig goes. I mean, I mean, I know I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. I really have no, no reason to complain whatsoever. And we, we here over here and my colleagues, uh, we have been very fortunate and, and we, we continue to, to get support from, from, from our organization, from the government. So, so really there is no comparison, but I, 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 do, I do feel for all those people who are working on a freelance basis and who are, who are working the ass of now trying to, to uh, sorry, it's a rude word, uh, yeah. <laughs> trying to make a living creating content. And, and I, hope, I hope at least some of them will succeed and and be it via the internet or or via other means to 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 earn some respect and and a feeling of 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 uh, pride for for what they are doing because they deserve it. We are all, our 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 culture and what we have achieved is is built on on those those hundreds and thousands of of people who are who are working so hard and 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 make music better and make it live and and keep engaging people so so yeah uh, it's it's a it's a very sore sore point and and it hurts me to see that that some people seem to 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 run away with with these huge obscene sums of money and 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 spend it on on idiotic stuff and and then there are all these people suffering or even going hungry in in our in our wealthy country, it's it, it's not only uh, in America, also in in socialized countries like like the Netherlands. Uh, there, there are children who go to bed hungry. It's it's unbelievable. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I think that that is uh, we're in a situation now where I think people who didn't notice that maybe a year or two years ago are seeing that in a very different light right now. And uh, as we said, the, the, the pandemic, if nothing else, pointed out inequalities, inefficiencies, all the, the parts in, in our society that, that weren't working, whether it was in healthcare, which is, of course, a massive situation in America, uh, probably the, the core part of our, our problem now, uh, the healthcare situation, or just the general um, idea of uh, the, the, the workplace safety net when things go wrong. Far too many people did not have that. And I think that when we do get out of this, uh, the dialogue will continue. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Th thank you. I, 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 hope, I hope you're right. I think you're catching me at a very good time post-election. Yeah. Because <laughs> while, it's not exactly, <laughs> while exactly it's not smooth sailing, it's at least not Armageddon. <laughs> I I uh, I promised myself not to speak about politics, <laughs> so let's sort of steer away from it again. I, I would very much like to to ask you uh, about a topic uh, where you know more about than any person I know, actually, except for my Chinese friend, and that is China. So what's what's happening now behind the Great Wall? 
Well, you know, China has never been the most um, uh, transparent of countries or cultures. So it is very difficult to actually know what's going on, particularly since I haven't been there since, uh, since January. Uh, I have in touch with, with several people who are, who are still there and are functioning. They um, have in a way a China first policy that is extremely um, uh, possibly a near exact mirror image of the US. In fact, there are times of, of it when we were listening to President Trump and there were things that he said that when I'm reading in a paper, I'm wondering what country am I reading? Is, <laughs> is this a translation of President Xi? I mean, it, just in terms of uh, possibly every single level, uh, the, some of the same mistakes, frankly, of, in terms of, of dealing with COVID were utilized on both sides, um, you know, particularly I, I, early on. And, and are you allowed to, to speak uh, in a critical way about uh, Chinese politics because you go there so often? Will they not catch you at the border and say, Mr. Smith, thank you, go back to New York? Well, as long as I can go back to New York, that's all I care. <laughs> you know? uh, it's getting out of the country that might be the problem. But, <laughs> but the, the, the situation, I'm not, uh, um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not making any grand pronouncements of that because at least we have the 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 power to to you know remove our leader at, at the polls. Uh, China does not have that, mm. and um, the and, and it's not just. I mean, what I grew up in uh, watching China use use culture as soft power basically to a large degree. Uh, the last ten years, uh, I, well, I would say from about 2004 to. 2014, uh, we saw China become a real force in terms of, of the world, uh, in the world of culture that we live in, in and part because will, of- Will that not be even increased now? Because obviously, because of their mentality, of the mentality of Asian people who are much more disciplined than, than the average American or European, they have much less of a problem with COVID. So, so they will come out of this or they're already coming out of this with a huge advantage. How, how are they going to exploit that? Well, well, in terms of exploiting it, it is probably not going to be through in, entering the international world of culture, because that would actually imply that you care about the rest of the world. Um, they, China now is, is very much focused on China and building the, its own sort of self-sufficiency in a way that they have not done uh, up until the past a few years. They, the, they are not about um, necessarily Shanghai and Beijing connecting to Washington and Paris and London. They are about relating that solely within, within their own national boundaries. And so what you find uh, regarding the arts is uh, a true lack of international connection now because there are no non-Chinese, there are no foreigners allowed in the country. I mean, it takes great hoops to, uh, for a non-Chinese person to enter the country, regardless of visa status right now. Even Hong Kong, which is much more open, uh, you, you still have a 14-day quarantine period to go in, which means that uh, there are very few conductors or soloists who can afford that kind of time in their schedule to go in and, 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 and play a gig. China's in a little better situation when they open because you at least have the opportunity to travel around the country and, and, and have a tour involved, for example. But this is really an opportunity for them to focus on their local artists and to give their local artists a platform that they've never had, frankly, because you don't have to compete with Gil Shaham who's appearing next door. <laughs> you have your, your focus and everything is, is really on, on that. And in terms of programming, um, you know, that the, the level of new music that's coming out of China is focused on, on, on Chinese audiences. You know, they're not necessarily worried about what people think when they hear it in Vienna or, or London. Hmm. So, so in that regard, on, in the arts, that is gonna continue, but it, and, and, and continue at, at probably a higher level, but uh, it will be in a very different social political mindset and it will not be about playing and working and playing with the rest of the world. So, hmm. because uh, I, 
I have a feeling that that many uh, orchestras invested a great deal in China, hoping to to open up markets there for for what for the product. Okay, let's speak in economical terms now. And I, I mean the, the the New York Philharmonic uh, was one of them, and 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 San Francisco, I believe, also, and and the European orchestras, uh, the, the, the London. The, everybody was going to China, and even if the if the tours were underpaid and 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 uh, people got sick. Uh, uh, on the tour and whatever i mean i've been to china with my orchestra three times and 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 it was for 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 a long time it it was seen as as the the emerging market for classical music maybe together with uh with uh, i mean taiwan also and korea uh after i mean japan obviously and is hopefully will continue to uh, this uh, their demand but, but so you think it was a bad investment? <laughs> well, uh, in terms of, it's, it's hard to say because um, I don't think China was ever as lucrative, say, as, as, as Japan was. And if you're talking about sheer money, you know, cash on the barrel head, uh, I don't think that was the case. People went in to build and to build relationships. I, I, and in I, fact... So I, I didn't mean just to talk about money. I, I'm also talking about... I know, I know. But I'm talking about people loving it, uh, people people caring for for what's happening and and uh, looking forward to a great concert and enjoying. I mean, uh, I've I've had uh, such great great concert experiences in, in the Far East and and uh, in 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 Korea and and I love the audiences in Taiwan, but also also I thought in, then in China uh, people were 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 obviously becoming more knowledgeable. I mean, the times that people walked with uh, talking into the phones, they uh, walking across the concert hall, that was maybe at the very beginning, but that, that it's long past. So, so I, I meant uh, investment in a broad sense, not in a financial sense. Well, well, yeah. I, I, well I wanted to get the money situation off the table okay. right away. Yeah. In terms of building the relationship though, yes, there is a, there's a huge amount of, 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 um, audience and appreciation and understanding in that order, I think, and in, in the chrono chronological order, people show up and then they, they gradually learn more about it. Um, that has gone on. I'm not sure if you really want to break it down, how much of that is because the New York Phil or the San Francisco Symphony is on tour, as much as it is that, that they can point to someone like Long Long who obviously grew up in China and obviously moved on. You know, the, the idea that, and, and you look at the number of orchestras when they return, New York, San Francisco being, you know, two big ones who have a significant number of Asian players, predominantly Chinese now. That makes a statement when they go back to China. Mm. And so people see that on stage and all of a sudden their relationship to the arts changes. This isn't some simple European thing anymore. It's about, you know, what, what this is, you know, it, it, it's about that exchange. And they used to talk about um, the brain drain, the, you know, the, and the talent drain, and the idea that in, um, uh, you know, it, all these European football teams that have players from Africa, you're just, you're, you're ruining the talent. Well, no, you know, for every African player who winds up on a European team, you've got 100,000 young kids who start playing soccer. Mm -hmm. You know, you build that, that audience as soon as you have role models out there that, that, that people can look at. And so in that regard, that's still gonna go, that's, that, that part is still continuing. And now the question is, has, uh, if China does continue on the current situation where they do in a way um, maintain the island uh, of cutting themselves off from the rest of the world, if that continues post COVID, uh, the classical music world will, in China, will evolve in a much different way than it will if they're connected to Europe and America. Uh, and and that, that is one of those things that I have no idea what will happen. But is it not a uh, kind of almost inevitable trend that as prosperity arises, which it has dramatically in China, then, then also the uh, the amount of traveling, which is now impossible, but uh, uh, 
the amount of traveling has 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 risen and and the chinese have uh, have become much more internationally orientated I, I don't mean the government necessarily but the people i remember the first time i went to china it was in 1985 and and i was the only western person uh, when i was walking across across this little uh, little part these low houses and i was walking there with my camera and and people they looked at me like i was an alien and quite justly i was also a bit taller than them but uh, they were very friendly and 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 very like uh, curious and 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 since then it has changed so much the, the, the people in, 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 in the big cities, but also Chinese people have traveled. They've come to Amsterdam in, in Hortz and to, 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 to the... So surely that must have some, some effect and, and they will... Don't you think they will have a desire to, to, to continue uh, looking further? Or... or uh, well, anyway, that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> Well, I, I, I left left to their own devices. I, I hope you're absolutely right that they would be doing that uh, under under the waves of of, of local politics. I, I really can't predict how that would happen. Yeah. In yeah. the same way that that normal average people in America turn into unrecognizable creatures when they are confronted with 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 television and whatever news broadcasts come out of of whatever ideological base. Um, you cannot predict what they will do uh, uh, from their own nature yeah. versus what goes out of out of you know international politics. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. I'm I'm just uh, I'm just so uh, I I feel a little bit in this quest, also in this uh, series of podcasts. I feel a little bit like Lancelot. I'm I'm looking for for answers, <laughs> and and you are one of the wise people. So so and and I'm I'm very very grateful because you have, have given us some some really valuable insights. Um, I, I I would like to to round off this conversation uh, with a with a personal question how is your life uh go going now how wh wh in in a practical sense uh, are, are you are you just just staying in, in in new york basically are you uh, are you writing are you writing a book like like uh many knowledgeable knowledgeable people do uh, when when they have nothing else to do so w w what are you up to well first of all i am not writing a pen Pandemic novel, so do not get alarmed. Uh, I must mention that the, the New York Times, uh, there was an article uh, about two months into the pandemic saying, stop, we do not need a pandemic novel now. You know, <laughs> wait, process things. We, anything written right now and immediate will, will be worth nothing. So I, I, I listened to that part. Mm. Um, uh, my wife, Joanna, and I work on many other projects. And uh, so there's some writing, submitting some, and some translation that, that has, has moved forward for, for us. Uh, and we've also started three of our little books, which I, I, I think you oh, are yeah, aware yeah, of those. Of the almanac. Um, we, we've started, uh, yes, we have, we have our Chinese almanac out this year, but we also have uh, uh, two or three other projects started and we reach a wall and we don't know how to proceed. So we put that down and we start something else. So we, we move forward. And of course, I do write uh, for magazines and, and, and uh, we have a, a, radio, a regular radio show that we do as well. So th things have moved forward at just at a slower tempo than usual. So uh, yeah. of what to do in the future, I, you know, how, how this is all gonna, re I don't know. I mean, there was a point, you know, when I discovered Asia, uh, back in the late 90s, right at, right at the turn of the millennium, was my first trip to Asia. And at that point, um, I realized that I was in a world that had seemed just too small and too self-referential, and I needed to an expansion. And I discovered Asia because at that point, that was a third of the world that I really didn't know anything about. You know, I, I, I used to say that I discovered China by way of Chinatown, but my frame of reference was all about Chinese who lived here. And so in a way, uh, when I started spending time abroad and, and opening that, that, that opened up my horizons in ways that, that I had never thought possible. And there's no way that my life in the past decade would, would have been conceivable to me back when I just lived in New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no way I would have even thought about that. And so, so now I'm looking for something that will open up the, the next chapter. And to take, and it's not like anything that I've ever done 
is, is, is closed. Now, I, everything that I've ever done in my life, I worked in book publishing and now I make little books. You know, all these things um, are now part of my life in a way that I, I had not predicted. And I'm sure in the next chapter, the same thing will happen, but we just need to figure out what that is because, you know, sit, sitting at home and looking at your computer screen 10 hours a day is not a sustainable lifestyle. Well, but you have the park in front of your house. You can just go out and, and, and go for walks. I, I'm, I'm, I'm usually not a jealous person, but that I'm really jealous of. This, 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 the fact that you can just cross the road and, and you're in the park. And uh, I miss it so much, I can't tell you. And, and I do hope that- That is probably why I'm saying actually. <laughs> I, I call it the, the, the great backyard that, that the city of New York mows for me. Yeah. And I, I hope at some point in not too distant the future, I can come and see you there. And then uh, we can laugh about the stupid things we said on this. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and maybe maybe uh, look back. But you're going to edit all those out. Mike. <laughs> you might going to edit all those, all those stupid parts out. Yeah, that's true. Then, then we'll refurbish it by that time. Okay, good. <laughs> anyway. It was definitely a pleasure to chat. Okay, thanks for And, and really, ne ne next time there will be glasses involved, there will be some sort of, of, of beverage, and uh, it will be lovely. Okay, thanks so much, Ken. Bye-bye. All right, take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>